Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 145 of Manage the Wild. I'm Nick Madsen. Today's episode is an interview with wildlife biologist Landon Schofield from the East Foundation in Texas. We were able to sit down and talk about all the different avenues and the different things that he's got his hands in. And he is full. His day is busy. Go ahead, sit back, listen, and hope you enjoy. I talked to so very few people that get to do what you do on the private side of things that, like, I'm just excited. I was listening, yeah, I was listening to your, uh, what, what is it called, your CWMUs? Yeah, Chad, with Chad yeah. Wilson. And just kind of, you know, getting perspective in, in terms of, like, recognizing that it's the minority of the area that's managed, right? Yeah. I've kind of been out of that public land dominant type system for a while now. And so it's, it's always kind of, it's good to. Yeah. And keep sharp in those types of ways. And I, I really struggled with that one. Uh, Cause I'm learning how to do this podcasting thing and interviewing and I cut them off a lot, but I was, <laughs> I was, there were so many things that I was learning in that interview that like my mind was just rapid firing and I forgot yeah. the fact that I was interviewing. <laughs> I don't I don't know if any of that you're driving the conversation. Yeah, I didn't know I don't know if any of that makes sense, but I completely lost myself in that conversation and forgot that I was supposed to be interviewing him. And cuz it was so unique on how the program was supposed to work versus how people perceive that program working. And so, yeah, and then the other thing is like you don't ever talk to wildlife biologists who are managing private wildlife or wildlife on private areas in such a large scale as the East <laughs> Foundation has. There's a few, yeah. and I'm working to do interviews with those guys, but there's so very few wildlife biologists working in your capacity, being able to work with wildlife like that. And for better or for worse, we're kind of an open book too. Like we're pretty forthcoming with in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Whereas that's not really the popular type mentality when it comes to private land management, right? <laughs> it is not that nobody wants to be open about what they're doing. I know quite a few uh, ranch managers that have large tracts of land and they're working on projects, but it is, you have to get a pry bar to get them to talk about it. Where the East Foundation, you guys are putting out annual reports. You're talking about all the research you're doing. You're talking about all the different groups you're working with. And you're talking about the direction that you want to go. So that's really cool. I don't know how much time you got. And I, I'm under your schedule. So, But there's like two different directions that I kind of want to go with today. If, if, it's, if possible. I kind of want to talk about your role as a wildlife biologist, East Foundation, how you guys incorporate those things. And then I would like to switch directions because once I heard about what your doctorate you're working on is, I, I kind of want to le learn about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Dude, no worries. You're awesome. Just roll with it. Yeah, you're <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Can you just talk about your background of how you got to the East Foundation and all that? Because you started out in Idaho and then you transferred mm -hmm. across the state or across the nation. Can you talk about what led you to the East Foundation and a wildlife biologist there? Yeah. So even backing up a little further, um, wildlife biology and, and conservation work wasn't even in my career trajectory or plans. I was actually planning on going to dental school and, and going the, den the dentist route, right? But, uh, you know, I, I joked that I convinced my wife to... Uh, agreed to marry me when I was planning on going to dental school. And then after she committed, I decided to change gears. But really what it was, was, uh, you know, it, it was it was something that didn't really excite me in the way that I thought it was. My motivations for it weren't something that I could see myself being excited about it long term. And and so I took a little time to figure out, you know, what what is it that that I would be excited to do every day? Um, I'm the type of person that don't necessarily like going to the same place and doing the same routine every day. Like if it's mixed up and, and changes from day to day, you know, I, I feel like I thrive in that sort of environment. And obviously growing up in South Central Idaho, you know, I was lucky enough to be exposed and mentored in the outdoors from hunting and fishing to, to those types of things. And, and lo and behold, kind of discovered you can kind of get paid a little bit to, uh, to, to work in that field. 
And, uh, and so that's, that's the route that we went. And so I finished my undergrad at the University of Idaho up in northern Idaho, um, pursued some, some graduate school opportunities, which led us to Louisiana at LSU, um, where I did my master's degree looking at uh, wild turkeys in the south and southeast. And um, from LSU, had the opportunity and, and, and heard about the East Foundation and um, had an opportunity to discuss with them, uh, the opportunity to work with them in the, in the capacity that I'm in now. And, uh, you know, things aligned and, and super fortunate to be able to uh, have moved from LSU, Louisiana, down to South Texas. And, and we've been here ever since. Um, and you kind of alluded it to it a little bit there, Nick, because it's, it's a very unique organization in terms of structure and mainly in terms of focus and mission. It's, uh, it's something that's, it's an operation that's super diverse in both landscape and, and land ownership, but also just the, uh, the types of things that we're curious about and that we want to pursue in terms of trying to answer those types of questions. Right. Yeah. And so it's awesome. My, yeah. So my, so I kind of pinballed around a little bit. It's, uh, it didn't follow by any means the five-year plan that my wife and I had put in place, you know, when we first got married. And it's heck, definitely not the 10-year plan, but it, it's funny how those things tend to still align. And in, in my case, I feel super fortunate that, it, that they aligned it the way that they did. When you started your undergrad, because we all had ideas of where we would go with our undergrad, did you see yourself taking the direction like LSU, did you always want to work on turkeys when you were in Idaho? Because <laughs> Idaho's not really known for their turkeys. No, no. Uh, and so I did receive some good advice, you know, my sophomore, junior year, knowing that I wanted to pursue grad school at some point to not limit yourself and like, like narrowing it down so, so fine that you limit yourself in terms of opportunities. Um, obviously, in our field, there's lots of things that have to align for the right graduate position to to fall into place, right? From Absolutely. funding to social, you know, being able to get along with your PI to a project that you're excited about to just logistically being able to be in that area. And um, and so I think just the, the rough filter that I had on it for me was working with upland game birds in some capacity and movement ecology. Um, and so with that granular type filter um there were several opportunities that i pursued but this one is the one that came to fruition and, and turned out being a great opportunity um you know the things that i learned there and was able to get exposed to but yeah so but definitely moving to lsu moving to louisiana <laughs> from like, Idaho. not not anywhere near not not on my radar at all absolutely not <laughs> no let alone the southeast um but it's yeah, it's but it looking back like that was a that was a pivotal move for us in a lot of ways, but definitely in in career trajectory for sure. And so it it wasn't an easy one by any means. You know, all of, all of our families are back out west, and they're still back out west. And so uh, you know, it wasn't without some sacrifice, but it looking back, we I'm glad we did it. That's awesome. Can you talk about your time at LSU working with turkeys? Because uh, when you started working with turkeys about the same time I started working for with turkeys at the Utah Division yeah. of Wildlife, we had two vastly different experiences working <laughs> with turkeys. Everybody hated I remember, mine. Yeah, I, well, I, and everybody loves them, but there wasn't as many down here as there were, at least where I was studying, as where you were at. And I remember talking to you on the phone, just kind of venting about frustrations and things, and you're telling me about how you're just swimming in birds. And I'm like, I can't get a bird on bait to save my life. Yeah. We trapped you know, and up. moved 700 birds in one season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Mike, the first year of my master's, I was working in an area where we were trying to, you know, answer questions as to why aren't there more birds here? Essentially. Right. Everything looks great. You know, what's going on. And in that type of a system, obviously there's not many birds. And I think we only put our hands on two or three that first year. Holy cow. And so <laughs> it's very different, right? Um, but uh, yeah, completely different systems, different different dynamics in play. And I, yeah, I remember talking to you, it's like, man, I, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> like what the <laughs> heck's happening? And you're just like, I can't, I don't have traps big enough. I don't have drop nets big enough for all these birds. Like what the heck? <laughs> Yeah. Can you talk about the questions you were trying to answer? Yeah. At, Absolutely. At, at LSU. 
Yeah, so I was I was fortunate in that when I rolled into the lab there at LSU, there had been you know a few years, a lot of years actually of of data accumulation across the southeast, and so um, and so what my project actually evolved into was looking at reproductive phenology and movement ecology of, of wild turkeys across the southeast, and also some some data sets in Texas with some Rio Grande turkeys, and so basically trying to understand a little bit better how movement ecology really influences some of those more, I mean, some of those more um, significant life history stages, um, mainly reproduction, right? And so a couple of my chapters look specifically at how does movement behavior of these female birds leading up to nesting and during nesting impact nesting survival? And so, you know, and how can we use that type of information to better understand resources on the landscape to ensure that they are that they have what they need from a habitat wide uh, standpoint, but also that they are still able to, um, you know, be reproductively active and successful. And so it, it yeah, it, it, my, my field sites were primarily in Louisiana in Kasachi National Forest, kind of in central Louisiana, but data sets that I ended up working with to complement all those types of data, to complement that work there in Louisiana was across from Georgia, South Carolina, um, Texas, and, uh, and yeah, so pretty much across the southeast. Wow, you were all over the place. Yeah, it was fun though. <laughs> it was good. It's definitely new country, right? Coming from from Idaho down to the southeast, a uh, uh, quick learning curve, you know, a steep learning curve rather, in terms of habitat and structure and and things like that, but also just social dynamics and management styles and and approaches and things like that. So it's it's good though, like that kind of trial by fire being put in those types of situations. It it stretches you. It stretches your capability to, to think a little differently and, and view things through a different prism than maybe what you thought was the norm. Right. Um, and so that's that was I think that's one of the biggest takeaways I can I could I, I, I had was, as a result of leaving the West to to study elsewhere was just that that stretching in perspective as well as um, interacting with you know different perspectives that way and opinions. Yeah. It's interesting. As I've been doing this podcast, I talk to people who live in different parts of the United States and into Alaska. And the the thing that blows me away, and I have to remind myself, is they don't have the same animals, the same wildlife there that we do here. And so mm-hmm. it, it was it a unique experience for you? Or can you just talk about it? Like when you got there and all of a sudden that realization, you're like, this is completely different than everything I've ever experienced in my life. I don't know. Just yeah. that's Let what- me, I'll, I'll give you a story that kind of highlights that exact point. So I got down to LSU at the October of the year that we moved down there. It was, you know, kind of mid late fall and uh, duck season wasn't too far around the corner. And so as a lab, we went out on a duck hunt one morning and completely different style of duck hunting. Obviously we're in flooded, flooded timber, cypress knolls, you know, things like that. We're chest deep in water. We've got our, we've got our layout out in front of us, our spread out in front no of us. No field blinds, no corn, what? No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, and all of a sudden one of my buddies, he steps on something and it almost like goes out from under him, like almost pulls his legs out from under him. And he was like, what in the world? And he was from New York. <laughs> and he was like, what in the world was that? And one of our, our lab associates who's from South Louisiana, he was there kind of guiding us and kind of helping us out. And we could kind of see whatever it was, just kind of, you know, bolt off. You could kind of see the ripples through the water. And he was like, oh, he's like, all good. He's like, you probably just stepped on a gator. <laughs> and like Patrick and I look at each other and we're just like, what in the world are we doing? <laughs> like this goes against everything, all of our natural wiring. Like we're standing here in chest deep water with alligators underneath us trying to shoot some ducks. And, and so, yeah, it was a completely different world in a lot of ways. Um, but also a lot of similarities, right? It's, but yeah, it was good. It was good. It, like I said earlier, it, it definitely stretched me in a lot of ways that I didn't think were possible and, and all in the good way. But, um, but at the end of the day, like we have the same goals, right? Yeah. It's just we're in different systems working with different species in different ways. <laughs> but at the, the end world? of the day, we want to do the same thing. Yeah. That's awesome. You just alluded to it, but even though they're completely different systems, you still, you said they're still somewhat the same. Can you talk about that? I'm just curious yeah. what you meant by that. 
Yeah. So I think kind of on a macro scale, right? We all want the betterment and the long-term success and conservation and preservation, not so much preservation, but conservation and success of a species, whether that's turkey, deer, mule deer, white-tailed deer, you know, whatever that is. Um, you know, there's there's a cultural and a traditional connection to that from a hunting standpoint to a subsistence standpoint, but also just a just a you know a recreational standpoint as well. That and there's value in having those types of things on the landscape. So even though we're in diverse parts of the country and working with diverse groups of shareholders, at the end of the day, I think we can all pin it back on we want these things to persist as long as possible. Um, to ensure that sort of cultural connection that we have to it. Absolutely. I love that. What uh, what were you able to find? You said that you were trying to find out why there was not enough turkeys, why weren't the population. What did you end up learning from your study? Yeah, so with that specific question, so that exact part that took me down there, yeah. you know, that didn't pan out quite as well as we thought it could uh, or would. Um, and so like I, my project kind of evolved a little bit in terms of area and as well as scope. So it kind of moved more to that movement ecology, reproductive phenology centric type question. And we found some, some real significant findings in terms of how much and when turkeys move, female turkeys specifically move as it relates to their ability to, to have successful nests and, and rear um, successful broods. And so what we kind of tie that back into is, you know, they've got their grocery store around them, right? They've got all these resources and things and if as long as we ensure that those groceries are appropriate and in and in the the right amounts, those birds are gonna less are gonna move less, which actually contributes to higher nest success. And uh, and so this was kind of just one small part of a much larger project that was being done there at LSU as well as the University of Georgia and linking that to male movement ecology, uh, gobbling chronology, lots of different components of wild turkey ecology all in an effort to paint that picture of how best can we um, ensure that we're, we're doing right by those birds. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. You know, uh, I was just thinking when you said it didn't quite pan out the way I wanted it to, I was thinking of the conversation I had with uh, Randall McBride, another wildlife biologist uh, a couple of weeks ago, his podcast aired last Friday, but he was uh, studying on another private piece of ground, roughly the same size as the East foundation. And he was studying how hunter interactions affect elk movement. Mm -hmm. And he found out the same thing that (laughs) you plan on looking at one thing, but then it doesn't pan out and you have to quickly adapt during these projects to come up. And yeah, if, if nothing else, flexibility, right? You've got to be adaptable. You've got to, you've got to roll with it because yeah, it's a natural, it's a natural system. It's dynamic. It's wildlife is going to be wild. And, uh, Plans don't always go according to plan, um, and that's okay. I think that's I think I think being comfortable with that is is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's hard. I, it's yeah. hard, but it's it's important. Yeah, as far as being wildlife management, being adaptable, like you said, because they're just constantly up and down. If there's a, if there's a problem, it makes it worse. If there's not, then things are going pretty good, and you think life is great, and then there becomes a problem. <laughs> then they humble you real fast. It's like, yeah, we got this figured out. And then, yep, you get a, get you a, get a torturous winter or uh, disease comes in and just creates problems. That's awesome. So your transition, now you go from, from I guess, almost the swamps of Louisiana, not really, but to East or South Texas, which is just largely, I don't know, I, from my perspective, from being from Utah, where snow is everywhere, it feels like it's largely desert. Yeah, it's, uh, so this area that we're in down here in South Texas, so I'm, I'm specifically based out of Kingsville, Texas, and most people kind of associate Kingsville, Texas with the King Ranch, uh, right? Yeah. And, and even those out west probably associate the King Ranch with King Ranch, King Ranch Edition Ford. Right? That's exactly that's, what I was thinking. That's exactly it. Um, and so it's an area that has a really rich history in ranching and in, in wildlife conservation. Um, it's got a, it's, 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 it's a unique landscape in, in terms of how it was formed, you know, over, over centuries and eons. And, and it's also unique in terms of just how productive it is as well, all things considering. Um, it's, it's actually, I, I see a lot of similarities with it in the area that I grew up in, in South central Idaho, um, that snake river basin, which is, you know, in essence, an alpine desert down here. Um, it 
it's a desert in its own right. It's the wild horse desert and it's part of the Texas sand sheet. But in terms of structure, I think if we just kind of swap, I mean, swap out the mesquite trees for sagebrush, you, you may not know exactly where you're at, <laughs> South Central Idaho or South Texas. So it's, it's neat in that sense. What are your duties at the East Foundation as a wildlife biologist? Yeah, so I'm the, the foundation's range and wildlife biologist. And so I'm part of essentially our science team, our science arm of the foundation. And so with that, we, we operate in a way that uh, we're able to facilitate curiosity. We're able to ask questions that are a- applicable and apply to, to our, our neighbors, but also and beyond. And so specifically, you know, myself as the range and wildlife biologist, it's kind of everything, I guess, under that umbrella, range and wildlife wise. Um, I, you know, a lot of data management, procurement, um, project design, um, actual deployment of those projects, field logistics, um, you know, everything that kind of goes in from start to finish in terms of asking a scientific based question. Um, I'll be involved in that process. And so I work really closely with our, with our research scientists, um, with graduate students, um, university faculty and partners that we, that we work with in basically, I mean, working towards that mission of promoting land stewardship. And, uh, and that's kind of the best way that we have doing that. And so my, but it's kind of hard to describe my position, I guess, in sense, like, yes, there's a lot of similarities from what you would expect a wildlife biologist does. Um, but what I'm afforded by working with the East Foundation is also a lot of diversity in those types of roles. So it's everything from from prescribed fire to whitetail deer captures to, you know, working with endangered species. So it's lots of different hats, it keeps me on my toes, stretches me in lots of ways. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, I guess, everything range of wildlife um, related for the foundation. That's awesome. Can you talk about uh, we did a little bit earlier, but can you talk about the East Foundation and the direction that they're trying to take this? Yeah, yeah. So just a little history, I guess, on the foundation itself, just to kind of give some context in that, I guess, to better describe just how unique it is. Um, it essentially was established through through the generous gift and vision of um, Robert East, of the East family, um, who passed away in 2007. He, uh, he had amassed, you know, a, a great amount of land assets and things through his life, through his ranching heritage and, and history, and um, had a vision of, of utilizing those assets for long-term wildlife and wildlife conservation, as well as better understanding the dynamic between cattle ranching and that wildlife resource. And, and so with the establishment of that, um, that's, that's, that's the vision that we try to uphold today. And so um, we operate on a little over 270, 217,000 acres here in South Texas. That's primarily spread across four major ranches, even though there's some smaller ones in there. The majority of that land holding is across um, four major ranches, you know, encompassing a a range of different landscapes and habitat types. Um, And, uh, and yeah, so, I mean, I guess across those ranches, there's, there's lots of different emphasis and focuses and things that we're able to tackle, but it's all, it's all centric under, each of those ranches is a working cattle operation. Um, we have a cattle a cattle um, company that manages each of those ranches um, for productive um, cattle production, as well as um, utilizing cattle as an effective tool to, to maintain and manage landscapes as well. So what I thought was interesting is when you first told me about the East Foundation, I was picturing like one tract of 211,000 acres just, but you're not, you're spread out over a large area. Some of yours is only like 600 acres in one, in one section. And then you have others that's 150,000, 27,000 in El Suaz. I don't know. El Sals. Yeah. El Sals. Yeah. Yeah. And then like the Santa Rosa (laughs) is, is higher North. And so you've got like, you almost feel like you're managing kind of like, I almost feel like you're managing kind of like you would a state in wildlife because you got different objectives, different plans for completely different habitat, so to speak. Yeah, and each ranch kind of affords different opportunities as well. Um, and so we, we try not to limit ourselves that way. Um, even though there's some similarities across all these ranches, there's also uniqueness to each one that definitely structures our focus and management objectives on those. 
How did they get to more of this direction of let's, instead of necessarily just focus on cattle production, how did they get to this direction of working in conjunction with wildlife and cattle and for the betterment? Yeah, so I think it kind of just follows the example and the mentality that's been here in South Texas for long before the East Foundation. You know, um, the King Ranch, Caesar Clayburg, you know, those types of people and organizations were instrumental in framing in large part how we manage wildlife from a game species, but also just a conservation standpoint. Um, they've always been, you know, in order to be successful in this part of the world, you have to be conservation minded. You have to be acutely aware of how your management actions are affecting the land that you're on um, in order to be um, profitable and successful long term. And so with that kind of mentality, you know, there's there's areas for diverse revenue. There's areas for diversifying and, and, and meeting objective goals. And so all those little pieces kind of lead to putting value and emphasis on, on those different aspects of your operation, whether it's cattle, wildlife, you know, it's multi-use, right? There's lots of different, lots of different pieces to the puzzle and ranching anymore. Isn't just ranching cattle. It's not just uh, managing a cattle herd or whatnot. Ranching is in essence, land stewardship and all those things that depend on that are part of that equation. So it's, it's not getting easier. It's getting a lot more complicated, <laughs> Um, but it's just as important. And I think, and I think what it all boils down to is, is ensuring that we're influencing decisions that ensure long-term profitability and ability for these land holdings to remain intact the way that they are, because they definitely play a, a significant ecological role in wildlife species down here. Um, Can you talk about, uh, like in wildlife management in states, they set objectives and different for based around hunting is the east foundation do they do they allow hunting on their ranches and then are your populations uh, maintained for hunting or is it just overall well-being of the animal so to speak yeah no that's a great question um you know east is also east the, the foundation is unique also in our in our approach to um harvest um, you know, we have a unique setup to where we can we can function as almost kind of like a control point or a control site for many of the different types of harvest related type questions as it relates to whatever type of wildlife species you're thinking about. Um, we are very we're very pro hunter. We're very pro harvest. Um, we understand the the cultural and traditional and, and economical benefits of, of that. Um, and we also recognize the extreme value that we have in terms of acting kind of as that scientific control to be able to answer types of questions that are harvest related. And so any sort of harvest type project that we bring onto the ranch is kind of put through that filter, right? What, what type of question can we ask and how are we best suited to tackle those types of questions that could essentially push the needle forward in whatever area that we're interested in, whether it's white-tailed deer, conservation or bobwhite quail or, or whatever it is, right? We want to make sure that we're best leveraging our land and wildlife resource to push um, that scientific knowledge forward. And so we do have, um, and so just to kind of to highlight a couple different areas where we're involved in that, we do have a long-term large-scale uh, bobwhite quail sustainable uh, harvest, uh, sustainable, sustainable harvest, sorry, jumbled my words, sustainable harvest study where we've been conducting on, on our ranches, basically kind of taking the idea of a, a theoretical type approach, which the general consensus down here and idea, and also the result of, a, of some, some models, you know, says that if you harvest 20%, that that's not too much or too little, and that populations can continue to persist at a, at a rate that you can continue to harvest them long term. But it was kind of a theoretical type model. And idea and so we were excited for the opportunity to be able to like you know let's test it let's do it you know let's challenge that type of that type of uh information and we've been doing that study um it's led by our one of our research scientists um abe woodard dr woodard who was the phd on the project and now works for east um overseeing that project full time and being able to better influence influence harvest strategies and um, distribution across the landscape to ensure effective and long-term success of bobwhite quail harvest. 
And so that's just one 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 example. Um, and so that is that is kind of the the approach that we take when it comes to harvesting on our on our ranches. We don't commercially harvest just um, for for a revenue sense. It's all put through that filter of how can what kind of questions can we ask, and where can we where can we best leverage our resource to to push the needle forward in terms of our understanding of that species. Okay, so. In conjunction with that question, because I'm unfamiliar with Texas, do you guys are you guys required on the East Foundation and those ranches to work with state wildlife officials in those type of things? Yeah, so I guess it requires the, an interesting word there. Yeah, because um, in Utah it's completely different, and so for me it's just trying to wrap my mind around how private organizations work with state organizations. Yeah. So I guess just some context in terms of Texas, right? It's over 97% private. Um, so a very different type of mentality and system yeah, than, way than Utah and Idaho than, than Western states. And so, um, and so those types of management decisions and approaches are primarily done on private lands. Um, TPWD is very instrumental in giving private landowners and operations the tools to be able to, um, manage, monitor, and make decisions that are appropriate for their situation, right? It's all context driven. And so I guess the required part, yes, there are, you know, seasons and, and limitations and policies and things in place in terms as it relates to wildlife, because that is a public resource. Um, and, but there is also some flexibility in terms of how specifically it's managed in terms of um, objectives, management goals, that's all landowner specific. Um, given, you know, influenced by those tools that TPWD provides. And so it, it's very different from a Western, from a Western approach um, in terms of managing um, wildlife. Um, but it is, you know, we do, we work in very close collaboration with, with, with the state department, with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, because we, we ultimately want to be able to best influence the ability, their ability and, and others to, to make decisions. Um, and so if, if we can structure things that can, in, can, that can provide some clarity for a question that they have, you know, that's excellent. And, and we'll continue to do that. So interesting how Texas is so completely different. It's, Utah it's, has it, like, they, they have all control and anything that happens on your property has to be approved. Whether you're removing an injured deer, it still has to be approved through Utah where you, the state of Texas, they it seems like they you have quite a bit of flexibility. Just because, I, I guess it's just largely because of it's vastly private. When you're setting your objectives for whitetails, do you take a you take a, in the percentage of whitetail habitat, and then you say this is our objective, and we're going to manage to that, or do you have because they don't migrate like mule deer would? Correct. So they're largely what I would guess call a residential population. Yeah. Yeah. So, so populations found on, at least on our ranches, you know, many, if not most of those individuals will live out their entire lifespan, never being pressured by a hunter, um, which is very unique. Um, and I think, and I think what, what it affords us is, you know, historically, even the East family, when they were, um, managing these lands, they weren't, they didn't have big commercial hunting operations either. You know, they, they, they valued the wildlife in the sense of, its place on the landscape and they they took that you know that role that they had and those species that were essentially under their their stewardship they took that very seriously now that's not to say that they didn't you know harvest deer and quail but they didn't do it at a scale that that um you know influenced populations and things like that over time and so the lands that we have and the populations that are on these on on these lands have historically never never been pressured to any significant degree by hunting and so what that affords us is kind of like i alluded to earlier is we can serve as as a really neat control site for questions that are related to harvest that are related to just the natural evolution of wildlife species over time as it relates to species i mean populations that are you know in an area that are exposed to a lot more disturbance or pressure or, or whatever it may be um and so it's not that we go into it basically saying we want X number of deer in this area. 
but it's a matter of why is this number of deer the way that it is and has been over time? What sorts of influences from a habitat to a disturbance to X, Y, and Z, whatever it may be, how has that shifted and why, how does that contribute to the result that we're seeing, um, which could be, you know, manifested in whatever response variable that you want to look at. But that's kind of how we approach it. It's not that there's any sort of manipulative type approach to it, but it's rather let's kind of figure out why it is the way that it is and how is that different from other types of systems that are managed the same way or similarly. That's interesting. Are your whitetail populations growing? Are they, are they at carrying capacity? Are there some limiting factors that you're seeing within the whitetail population? Yeah. So our whitetail deer populations have become, I, we would deem them as stable. Um, now you could probably look at that, that word and have several different types of definitions for it. Um, so even though that there's fluctuations from year to year, from a long-term history and, you know, since monitoring these, these populations at the level that we do, it's relatively stable. And so what we can kind of conclude from that is, yeah, they, they're fluctuating around carrying capacity. They're definitely not in any sort of shape to where they're pushing it from just a body condition size and number wise, you know, they're, they're doing just fine. Um, but being largely regulated naturally from natural causes from predation to disease or whatever it may be but our populations are 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 stable yeah that's awesome you're not having those massive fluctuations and then trying to figure out whether what's what's the cause no we i mean we see we see you know year to year fluctuations but it's not like a precipitous drop off you know <laughs> where you're losing a couple of do you guys have a, over a thousand or like how big's your like when you're talking about a white tail population on your ranches how big how many animals are we talking about yeah so it would be a density i guess maybe i'll just kind of put it in terms of density you're probably yeah. looking at a density of about one to 20 one to 25 okay um and then and that's i guess maybe even a little higher probably one to 30 enterprise wide if you're kind of taking the, the average um, and so with that, it kind of builds in some some kind of foundational resilience, right, to to be able to tolerate episodic dra- uh, droughts, which we which occur in this this area quite frequently, um, you know, potential disease outbreaks, things like that. So even all those other things that are thrown at them, you know, that's kind of what it hovers around. Um, can we talk about another thing? I never learned about these animals until college, but ocelots. I think they're super yeah. fascinating. We had a, I had a genetics professor who studied ocelots uh, in South Texas, going across oh, really? Mexico. And then um, he what was also, their name? Uh, I'm going to have to look it up. I just drew a blank as I was saying it, because I knew you were going to ask, because it probably happened <laughs> near where you guys were. And then he did some in Costa Rica as well. But can you talk about ocelots? There's not very many. Yeah, of them. I mean, who who knew that we have a, a native spotted cat that lives in the United States, right? <laughs> native. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. So they historically their range was you know all all throughout South Texas along the Gulf Coast and even up into Louisiana and Arkansas. Oh, I didn't know they went um, that far. Yeah, yeah. So there's trapping trapping records um, from a ways back, obviously of of individuals being being trapped up in those areas. But now they pretty much exist within the United States, exist within um, kind of two isolated populations from each other. There's the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge down in Cameron County, which is pretty much the southernmost tip of the of Texas, which is the Laguna Atascosa Wildlife Refuge, where there's a, um, a breeding population there. And then further north, which is where we're located, we kind of deem it the, the ranch population, if you will, because these populations exist on private lands, on private working um, ranches. And so between those two, I guess I'll speak more to kind of the ranch side of it. You know, we estimate those numbers to be anywhere between 30 and 60 individuals um, with a little bit less down in the, the refuge. But what's happened is, you know, these these pockets of ocelots that exist still in the United States have become geographically in, in a large sense, but also just genetically isolated from each other which, you know, that's kind of a recipe for disaster, <laughs> as we know. Um, and so, and so essentially it's, it's a matter of, you know, figuring out the best way moving forward to, to deal with those types, those two limitations, both the geographic isolation, but also the genetic um, diversity of those cats. And, and I kind of, I kind of have a funny story how I learned about ocelots as well. It was, 
So Dr. Tuis, Mike Tuis, who's kind of, he's been the one to really be the trailblazer in terms of ocelot um, research in South Texas. He's he's worked from with ocelots from from the time of his PhD to his entire career, and he's still here at Caesar Claybrook Wildlife Research Institute in Kingsville, and uh, and he. Small world is he's actually a, a University of Idaho alum, <laughs> alumni, and it was my senior year of undergrad where he was in town um, for, you know, an alumni event or, or what it was. And and our our teacher, our professors had asked him to do a guest lectureship in one of our classes. And he came in and talked about the ocelots, obviously. And all of us Idaho kids are looking around at each other like, what in the world is this? Like, <laughs> first off, like what the heck is this? And yeah. since when have we had them in the United States? You know, it was just new for us. That's exactly how um, I thought of it. Completely too. off our radar. This is fake, like a flying squirrel. <laughs> it's not real. Sounds like but, another Texas tall tale, right? Like, oh, they just brought those in, right? And, uh, but no, to come to find out, you know, that was my first exposure to it, essentially to ocelots. And over the years, you know, I found my way back in, I mean, not back in the South Texas, but found my way to South Texas and, stumbled into Dr. Tuis and I shared that story with him and he just kind of had a good chuckle about it. <laughs> and he's like, here we are, you know, let's get to work. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's, it's been really great to be able to, uh, to work um, in that aspect on, on these foundation properties. And it's, it's a, uh, it's a really neat story in that in order for ocelots to, um, to be successful and for them to be able to be conserved and, and ensured a, a future of success, um, you know, in South Texas and beyond mainly South Texas, it's, uh, it's going to require the, the work of, of these private ranches, these private working ranches, right. Um, which is a little different system than, than endangered species work that's, that's taken place elsewhere. Um, and so it's, it's a, it's a really neat opportunity for us to work, in partnership and hand in hand with all those partners involved from federal to state agencies to our neighbors across the fence, right? It's going to take a collaborative effort between all of those, all of those groups to, to make this whole thing work. See, that's the part that's so different in coming out West here. It's largely you're working with state and federal lands, and then you're getting a few uh, private entities to, participate in the program but where you're at it's largely reversed there's not a lot of state there's not a lot of federal ground and so it's largely conservation that's happening within these private organizations yeah no it's safe to say that if ocelots will continue on the landscape in texas it'll be on private lands absolutely that's so crazy that's awesome that you get so much participation in that program for these animals to continue to persist yeah, no, and it's and it's it's good for all of us because it it continues to build that trust and relationship on a federal and state level. Um, it also shows, you know, private land stewards, you know, they they've been doing right by the land for a long, long time, and they're going to continue to do so. And who better, what better resource to to work with than than that sort of person in in in, in thought process, right? Like, absolutely. All right, we're going to switch gears a little. Uh, Whitetail deer. Nil guy and your just overall cattle operation. Like Nil guy is something that again, ocelots was out there for me, but now you got an exotic <coughs> species that was brought in what the twenties, nineteen twenties, somewhere I don't know, yeah. somewhere yeah, around then. 20s. And so you've got that's the one thing I think Texas is really fam- famous for. For me, is their exotic population of animals and how how do these species interact and how do you continue to work with maintaining that population yeah so i'll speak mainly to neil guy just because that's what we 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 deal with mostly uh, have you have you seen a neil guy before I, I you know i'm looking at a picture right now other than that i've never <laughs> seen one in person pretty pretty cool looking critter isn't it different different, <laughs> different. Yes. that's a good way to put so, it what they're from they're from asia right southeast asia I think. Yeah. Asia, I- India. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's and they're big. Reason. They're huge. They seem, I mean, I've never seen one in person, but they seem as large as an elk. Yeah. Yeah, they can be on, um, you know, on the hoof, five, 600 pounds. Um, for the males. Is that what they are? For the males. So yes, they're just yes, a sir. hair, hair smaller than an elk, but they're larger than deer. 
like a white tail or oh lots bigger than deer or yeah. mule deer yeah wow yeah. no the yeah so so they're interesting and, and again it's one of those things that before even hearing about the east foundation in south texas somebody had mentioned to me like oh you're gonna see some nil guy i had never heard of a nil guy before i was like what are you talking about and uh and yeah no, they're 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 definitely interesting and you can even see some of the see some of that interesting qualities to them just from like their scientific name um Boslaphus trigocamelus. And so if you kind of break that down a little bit, bos meaning um, cow or cattle, right? Um, Ephelus is, is deer, the Greek word for deer. So like cow deer. <laughs> and then, or maybe I mix, mixed that up. Yeah, yeah. Ephelus is deer. And then tragos is, is I guess, translated into like he goat. But camelus is, is actually how, you know, exactly how you would think that that sounds like camel yeah right so think about when they're forming that that <laughs> word that name by looking at this animal it kind of makes sense now Dude, that you see it right yeah the picture it's you guys a, have nil guy on your annual report just makes me laugh because it's, it's like kind of a, a cow deer goat camel thing <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what it looks like like it's got the horns of a, of a mountain goat or just a regular goat it's got the face yeah. of like a white tail and then just this massive body. Yeah. And even, even though that they are, you know, introduced, they're non-native. Um, I think that they've in essence kind of earned a right to kind of be part of the mystique of South Texas. Um, so they've been around long enough and they've got, you know, a, a very healthy respect, um, and you and utility from landowners down here and, uh, you know, for having them on the landscape. Um, but in terms of kind of your initial question of, deer, nil guy, and cattle, like that intersection point. Um, you know, there are some areas where, you know, there's direct competition happening, um, but there's also kind of some some concern and considerations to take into from just a wildlife disease standpoint as well. Oh. Um, and so nil guy, nil guy are, you know, they're, they're pro prolific breeders. They're, um, they move far distances. They don't really have a healthy respect for, for barriers um, in terms of like fences. <laughs> <laughs> like so like they're not great jumpers and so in order to to go through a fence they, they just prefer through. to go under them oh, yeah. under. Well, they will yeah i mean i've seen them try to go through them but they prefer to just kind of go under it and you know interesting like that. a pronghorn exactly yeah and so you wouldn't yeah same sort of deal you look at them and be like you could like a pronghorn you think yeah. you could just jump right over that fence right and they don't but they don't same sort of deal and so and so with that, you know, there's some considerations in terms of how does that play into managing disease risk and things like that. And the, the main one that I'm kind of thinking about and would be alluding to would be, you know, cattle fever ticks and, and cattle fever. You know, they are a known host to, to carry that tick, the cattle fever tick, um, which um, historically was you know, kind of attributed to um, the decimation and in, in certain in certain ways for cattle ranching in, in Texas during the time and and kind of when it was discovered, you know, these herds from Texas were were shipped up to, to Kansas. And once the Texas cows moved in, you know, these, you know, cows within within these feed yards started dying and it was later discovered that it was a result of this of this tick, but more more specifically the parasite within that tick. Um, the agent um, that was causing was causing all those issues, and so for the most part, it's all been but eradicated from the United States. But um, there is still, you know, movement of that tick along the uh, the southern border, um, both north and south, that you know poses a potential risk. And both white-tailed deer and nilgai um, are hosts um, for that tick. And so, I guess that intersection, that that interplay between there and how it relates to cattle is. You know how do those how do those individuals naturally kind of distribute themselves across the landscape to a, to account for each other, but also for kind of just resource selection and competition, right? And um, and if they do come into contact with each other, which is an opportunity for that disease transmission, you know what does that look like? What can what influences them to be, to come back into close proximity? Like all those different things in play. And then at the end of the day, what can we do as a manager to help mitigate that? So what sort of actionable type thing can we learn from this 
that we can apply on the landscape to help manage that as well. Um, and so that's kind of the, I guess the, the, the crux of, of, of that little interplay right there is, you know, what are we learning and how best does that learning influence our ability to, to make decisions on the land that actually has, you know, results or some sort of um, outcome. And all your questions are generated from other questions. You answer one question and then you yeah. bring in the research. To <laughs> That's a good question though, right? I would think, yeah, because it's, I mean, we work in a dynamic system, right? Like wildlife, natural landscapes. It's as soon as you learn one thing, it should pique curiosity in another thing. And, and a good question, I think, is one that continued, that can be continued to be layered on other questions and areas. Um, to just further that knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. I really, I just find it so fascinating. Uh, it's just a completely different system than where I'm from. <laughs> that it's, it's just so interesting that you can have threatened or endangered species, you can have exotics, you can have natural, and then you can have agriculture all blended. And I mean, it's not, it's not a seamless process. There's obviously challenges. Yeah, no, there's, there's, Exactly. There are those challenges to it. And, and especially with Neil guy, like there's just a lot of ecology type questions that we just don't know yet. And because you're you taking know, them know, out of we, their natural environment, putting them into this one. But now this one, they've been here so long that it's yeah. almost become their natural. And so now you've got to learn to. And we honestly know more about them, Neil guy in Texas than we do Neil guy in their, you know, their native range, you know, and in Asia and India and places like that. And, uh, but you can't ask the same questions. That's what's crazy. <laughs> yeah, because, absolutely. Uh, because the factors that are facing in Texas aren't going to be the same in Southeast Asia or India or because it's completely different habitats, different diseases, different predators. That's so interesting. Different, yeah. They, they evolved with tigers. Like they're not, they're not running around with tigers. <laughs> is that their, Texas. is that their main predator? Yeah. And then yep. in Texas, What's the main predator? Is it coyotes or is it cougars? Do you guys it'd have, be hunting? It'd, it'd be it'd be humans. Humans. Yeah, they they really don't have a natural predator um, down here. Um, you know, there may be a very small window during the calving when they calve that a coyote could potentially um, have that opportunity, but that window is is really small. Yeah. How large is your guys' cougar po population down there? Not very large. Yeah, we, uh, we don't. Yeah, we don't have any documented uh, cats on us on on your property. Okay. Historically, yes. Yeah, yeah. historically, yes, they were there. There are um, probably some you, you moving know, through, but <clears throat> not very many. Exactly. You know, you hear you hear reports of folks seeing them on a game camera passing through. Mainly, you know, they're mainly tied to those riparian areas that intersect certain properties. Um, but no, ours is all but you know minimal, if any. So the main pro uh, predator you have on your uh, foundation is what coyote. Is yeah. That, is that yep. roughly? Okay. <clears throat> yep. I was actually Absolutely. just looking at a couple of papers you've helped on and I laughed when I read the name and it was, uh, the coyote conundrum <laughs> <laughs> because I think that's all wildlife. They print it. They, they're always a conundrum. You want more wildlife on your we may, property? We may need the trademark trademark conundrum. <laughs> yeah, because you always want more wildlife on your property, but then it creates a conundrum because then you want to manage them so they don't get too high. And then yeah. you want more, and then they bring a disease, so then you got to start managing disease. You know, it's just it's a conundrum. Like the, the state conundrum. of Utah. That's kind of a fun word, too. Yeah. The state of Utah hates feeding wildlife, but they feed wildlife to help so they don't have to feed wildlife. <laughs> like they feed elk, but they don't want to feed mule deer. But elk don't necessarily need it, and mule deer do. But if you bring in and start feeding mule deer, it changes their behavior, spreads disease. So you don't want to do that. So you feed elk to keep elk out of haystacks, which they were being fed by farm. It's just a conundrum. It's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's an all-encompassing word, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the one thing that I'm really interested in is how you guys monitor wildlife. I called you one time and you're like, yeah, I'm just about to go and hop in a helicopter. So you're roughly managing wildlife the same way state agencies are. Absolutely. Yeah. So we, uh, we use uh, helicopter aerial surveys, you know, which is a similar approach to, you know, many, if not most state agencies with, you know, when the, when the area affords them to be able to do that. Um, we use a we use a process called distance sampling, where you fly fixed transects, and through distance sampling, basically it it 
I guess the assumptions are that the further out from the transect line or from the helicopter, <coughs> excuse me, your, your ability to detect individuals decreases. And so there's kind of like a detectability factor, a kind of a correction factor that's played into there that essentially gives us our overall population estimate. Um, and so, yeah, we do, yeah, we do long, we've been doing long-term aerial surveys for, for ever, ever since the foundation's been established. And so it, it attributes mainly to that long-term trend type data. Um, we also, as part of other projects, we kind of get a little more fine scale as well. So monitoring um, indicator species such as small mammals, birds, things like that, um, which is kind of overlaid with some other research projects. So those are kind of overlaid with some of our grazing type questions. They're also overlaid with some of our prescribed fire type questions. And so basically, you know, how do those different management actions influence the the response of these other um, types of species and things like that. Um, so we monitor at different levels, different scales, um, kind of depending on on the question at hand. But the things that are continuous from year to year are our aerial surveys. Yeah, our, we call them our large mammal surveys. So we're counting everything from nilgai, uh, feral hogs, white-tailed deer, coyotes, javelinas, uh, and, uh, and then mentally in my mind, I also count turkeys, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm biased that way. Yeah. I don't blame you. I understand. I like <laughs> turkeys, but for a stupid reason, I like them because they run funny. They just make <laughs> they've me got laugh. A, they've got a prehistoric look to them, don't they? They, they like, do. Like I, when I would uh, trap turkeys and people just got to the point where they hate them, they'd try chasing them around and the, the turkeys would just take off running and the people would be running after them and I would just laugh. They're I agree so with fast. you though, that if, if you're ever having like a, a, a bummer of a day, just watch turkeys. Like, watch a turkey run. <laughs> yeah. What's so crazy is like I watch turkeys go through an alfalfa field and they lined up in a perfectly straight line and they just, I swear they got every grasshopper. It was just amazing how they would line up and move through a field. So I'm, I'm biased for turkeys, but it's for not the same reasons you are. Mine are different. Yeah. <laughs> no, equally important. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that you guys are focused on is bobwhite quail. Can you talk mm -hmm. about how you monitor them, the different projects you've got going on? I know that's not necessarily your area, but I just find Absolutely. it interesting. Upland game type things. Yeah, so no, that, that project that, that Dr. Woodard um, spearheads. And so we actually monitor and survey our quail the same way we do our large mammals, um, aerial survey. How does exact that work? Same, yeah, so it, it, we fly a lot lower and we fly a lot slower, um, almost basically at tree height. But the concept is the same. We still utilize distance sampling. Um, it's a little more fine-tuned because we use um, range finders, which is tied to kind of a central computer. Anyway, it all plays into we're, we're essentially flying um, and we're counting coveys. And Are you flushing them? The, and so we're flushing them, but also there's times that they don't flush. They just, um, you can see them running on the ground or even circled up. And so we fly those exact same transects just at a, you know, a little different method, but same concept um, from helicopter. So that was actually a technique developed down here in South Texas. Um, being able to, to survey these large expanses of land um, for quail. And that kind of proved to be the most effective. You know, obviously there's lots of different areas, lots of different ways to do that. You can do roadside surveys, covey calls, you know, lots of different things. Um, but in order to kind of get that really fine estimate of population abundance, fine enough to where you're comfortable making a, a harvest prescription based on, um, these aerial surveys proved to be super uh, beneficial in, in helping to, to make those types of decisions. Can you talk about something I've never been involved in because it doesn't happen on state or federal property, but that's seasonal burnings. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're kind of, we're kind of hitting on all those, those different tools that like Aldo Leopold's identified, right? The, the cow, the plow, the ax, fire. What's the other one? The gun. Yeah. I guess in Texas, we'd also add helicopter to that. <laughs> So we've got, yeah, you got, the we've got six, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, absolutely. So yeah. Uh, you know, prescribed fire is obviously a, a tool in the toolbox and, and it's a historical natural disturbance that, that this land has evolved with as well. Um, and so obviously now we want to better understand um, how best we can use fire to meet whatever objective goal it may be. 
Um, and so we have a, a long-term large scale fire study that's actually been in place for a little over eight years now on our cells, our, our El Sal's ranch, which is that ranch right along the, the Gulf coast. And, um, the initial thought behind that was how can we better use, utilize a specific plant species, which is Gulf cord grass? How can we better utilize that and use that resource um, for cattle grazing? Um, and uh, because what happens that particular species when it gets mature, it becomes really coarse. Um, it's really hard to even walk through. It's really pokey. And, uh, you know, the protein value goes down, fiber increases. And so there's just not a lot of utility in its mature state. Um, but when you burn it, you know, that new emergence is just, it's the good stuff. It's extremely soft and palatable, nutritiously rich. Um, and it's, you know, it can, uh, can afford you a lot of flexibility from a grazing standpoint, almost affording you like 45 to 60 days of grazing um, that you wouldn't otherwise have. And so um, that was the initial thought, like, how can we better utilize this? And obviously there's some other questions in there, like, you know, as a result of burning, what sort of response from a vegetative community do we see? You know, are we seeing an increase of different grasses, different forbs? How can we um, <clears throat> kind of manage these monocultures of gold cord grass from a wildlife perspective? You know, can we do that? And so I guess the entire essence of, of that entire project is, and you'll kind of see a th common theme here, right? Where they're all kind of framed within a research type question. And so what is the, you know, what's the best time of year to burn, but also what's the best return interval to meet those types of objectives. And so we, we conduct our prescribed fire burns either in the summer or the fall or the winter. Um, and then there's a return interval of either three or five years, a short or a long return. And just better understanding how the land responds to those types of um, management type actions um, is hopefully, you know, some of the things that we can gain some information on that's applicable that folks that our neighbors across the fence can can apply on their place as well or you know learn from us and be like what not to do <laughs> yeah that's also part of it right there's value in that as well yeah both both directions for sure absolutely after you guys burn do you come in and reseed or do you just let the natural course take place and see what pops up yeah so we we don't burn until we you know unless the, the soil moisture is at appropriate levels um, we don't want to set ourselves up for failure it's all soil moisture driven precipitation driven um, but we allow it to all come back naturally we don't go back in with any sort of um, seeding or any any effort like that and and you know the neat thing about this this country is it's extremely resilient um, you know you could you know if you know we're going through a, a period of infrequent rain or things and things look pretty crispy you know just even a, a quarter inch to a half inch of rain can just completely transform this country um, from one day to the next and the same thing with fire um, it's it's extremely resilient and productive as a result of fire and uh, like I said it's it's a disturbance that it's evolved with historically um, that kind of natural burn mosaic type 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 yeah. Are you guys working yeah. with a, a lot of invasives down there as far as plant species, or is that not something that's really popped up in that area? Yeah. So the majority of our lands are native, native range lands, which is extremely neat. It is. Um, there are a lot of introduced species, you know, on, on there's areas of introduced and non-native species on our lands as well. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's, they're intact kind of coastal, um, sand, um, wild horse desert native rangelands which is neat and it's really unique that way. Um, you know, we do have areas where, where historically, you know, different um, non-native species were introduced, you know, like buffalo grass, things like that, with the purpose of having a more predictable and consistent grazing resource um, for cattle. Um, but also, you know, there's questions and opportunity there is how best can we manage those to also satisfy and, and that can, you know, better, benefit um, wildlife species as well yeah because um, they're here so yeah how let's do it let's let's how, how best can we utilize it absolutely all right some of the last topics i want to talk about as far as the east foundation <coughs> feral hogs and coyotes um coyotes here in the state of utah they have a bounty on them but it seems like you guys are taking a different approach to it at least from yeah. the annual report, you guys are more focusing on how can you work with nature where Utah is more, how can we stop the natural things that coyotes are doing? 
<laughs> so I guess it, yeah, I guess it kind of comes down to how best can we use the biology and ecology of a, of a species towards the end that we want to see, right? In this case, it would be coyotes and how best can we use what they already do and how they're wired. Um, I guess in some cases, how can we use it against them? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, how best can we manage them um, to meet our objectives? And so, yeah, the, and so initially on that type of project, we were really kind of understanding first, how are they just naturally dispersing themselves across the landscape, you know, from a territory wise to a movement wise and better understanding that has influenced, okay, what types of things can we do to alter that behavior to mitigate risk on, let's say, you know, calving season for, for cattle. And, and so how can we alter their behavior um, during different um, life history stages from the cattle side? And so what we found from a movement side, first off, is that, you know, they're dispersing themselves in these very well-defined defended areas, um, and which are occupied by a single coyote. And so as a result, you're going to have those distributions across your landscape regardless, unless you do a complete culling, which is very labor and economically expensive. And so the, the common practices to, to try to manage those coyotes, you know, is, you know, by lethal means or, or trapping or snares or things like that. But what we kind of concluded was those individuals that you're actually ending up trapping are transient individuals, individuals that are kind of finding their way through these little transition areas where different territories kind of butt up against each other. So they're moving through the landscape. You know, those are those ones that you end up that end up in snares. Those are those ones that you probably end up seeing from the road and shoot and things like that. But regardless of that, there's still these established populations, I mean, these established individuals across the landscape. And so it kind of evolved into, okay, now how can we kind of alter that sort of hierarchy, but also just dis, just structure um, to mitigate risk for like, for instance, for cattle calving. And so we, we did a little study where we, you know, aerially gunned feral hogs and so carrion type deposits. Can we actually alter their behavior and their movement by giving them a, a resource for a time? Does that make sense? So yeah. instead of them targeting cattle and calves, we're now giving them feral hogs in certain areas that could pull them out of those sensitive type areas that we don't want them in certain times of the year. Um, and that was the result. Like that's, that's what we were able to do. That's so, so interesting. It's a very, yeah, go ahead. Go, no, go for it. No, it's just fascinating that you can use something that everybody hates feral hogs and you can use them to affect the behavior of something that everybody here in the West largely hates and that's coyotes. And that you could just by laying down a few animals, you could, move or alter their behavior yeah and and it's a win-win right it checks two boxes <laughs> it controls your pigs a little bit but it, it also you know keeps keeps that 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 perceived predator out of a sensitive area for a time and so it's not a perfect system by any means and it requires a lot of planning and and thought process in terms of how best to kind of manage manage those coyotes and or whatever it may be but it's it's just an example of thinking i guess kind of thinking a little bit outside the box and 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 testing that kind of thought process and those are the types of things we like we like to tackle you know those 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 things that um yeah. that yeah it's kind of common knowledge or the or kind of your your initial thought is like well that should work and it's like well, does it I don't know. Let's try it. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, let's, let's tackle that. And so that's just kind of one of those examples. Yeah. The last one, uh, feral hogs, we don't have that type of problem here, but can you talk about feral hogs, how they impact the land you're trying to manage and the challenges you face with them? Yeah. So South Texas, you know, we obviously have feral hogs, but we don't really have them at the densities where they cause a tremendous amount of significant damage. Thankfully. Yeah. You know, our, our densities of hogs, you know, ebbs and flows on the year, you know, to be, to eke out a living as a feral hog down here, you got to be pretty tough. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of the, the solid hard mast um, and soft mass for that matter that, that they would get the state like throughout the Southeast or, you know, further North or whatnot. And so they're, they're looking for, you know, a lot of sedges and, and roots and things like that. So it's the resource base form isn't quite as abundant 
Um, as a result, you know, populations aren't quite as thick, but they definitely are here. And left unchecked, they'll continue to, to grow, even if at a slower rate, continue to expand that way. And so just like just like our, our nil guy, um, you know, they're part of our, our management, number management, population management type approaches as well. So, you know, whether we can tie that into a research question or not, great. Um, but we still, you know, opportunistically keep those things in check as much as we can. But Do you see that population it, growing? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it it's expanding, um, but it also is dictated. So if we get a hard drought, they'll also feel that as well. Um, so they kind of respond to it in, in a lot of similar similar ways as, as other species as well. Um, just because of that habitat food resource isn't the same as it is in like other areas like the southeast or whatnot. It's not as predictable for them. So they're they're just as sensitive to some of these natural natural disturbances as well. So even though, yeah, so even though I guess something to keep in mind there is even though we don't see this rapid expansion of pigs on, on our lands that, that we manage, and that's pretty much all I can speak to, Yeah, you know, range wide for these feral hogs, it is expanding. Numbers continue to expand. Like they are very good at what they do. <laughs> that's making more pigs and, uh, and eating and, and eating like they're, they're great at it. Um, and so it's, it's important to, you know, when you tackle a question like feral hogs or any sort of invasive or non-native species to, to make sure you, you've got it in context in terms of the scale as well as, you know, just the expanse of what you're trying to ask. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about, uh, as far as the East Foundation? Man, I think, I think you covered it. Yeah. And so, I mean, I guess just to kind of to highlight it's you know the science arm of it which is obviously what i'm mainly entrenched with it's just kind of one arm of the yeast foundation we also have a a very um large and very significant education arm that you know that outreach and the the numbers that they're able to reach to get messages out and to expose elementary middle school and high school kids to ranching and just the land itself you know so that there's that that connect and even whatever capacity is is you know they do a, a tremendous job at that yeah so last because, year alone it's or in 2021 and 2022 you guys reached out and talked to 11,667 kids yeah <laughs> yeah they, what they, in the world they've got a lot going on and so they do that through a lot of different mechanisms they they do like field lessons where students, you know, school buses roll up on the ranch and they, the kids are out there for the day and they, there was over 11,000 virtual ones. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's a great example of just some of the silver linings, I guess, from the pandemic when, when school, school districts weren't, weren't going on field trips. Right. So it's like, how do we still reach these kids? And, uh, and so, yeah, virtual field lessons. So now, you know, those are accessible on the website year round and, and, you know, even, you know, internationally, you know, they're being utilized, which is just phenomenal and, and really, really neat. I'll have to talk to my wife because uh, after I'm done with this, I'm headed to her class and we're talking about predator prey and we're playing a mm -hmm. game, a predator prey game. And yeah. it'd be it'd be fun for her class to see something completely different as far as the habitat and seeing if they could use some of these virtual lessons. But that's so to see to see how it's different but to also make the connection that it's really the same. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because they uh they had over 1740 students go onto the ranch itself and do those field lessons. That's awesome. It's pretty neat. Yeah, it's uh it's definitely one of the one of the things that that makes the, the East Foundation unique is like a lot of most people I think when they associate the East Foundation it's it's the education side of it that they've that they initially learned about or, you know, before, make that with. before they Absolutely. Made it. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Well, thank you. I appreciate you talking about the East foundation. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Landon Schofield from the East foundation wildlife biologist. There's going to be a second part. It kind of ended abruptly and that's because we weren't done talking on next Friday's episode. We'll transition into his work, working on his PhD in carbon sequestration I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. If you did, like it on Facebook, Instagram, go ahead and subscribe on all the different channels that we're uploaded to. Hope you guys have a great day. Stay wild.